Mickey Free was born Felix Tejas in the late 1840s to Maria Jesus Martinez, a woman from Mexico. His father's name was Santiago Tejas. The young couple met and fell in love when they were both 16 years old, but they didn't get married, possibly because Santiago's parents opposed it. In 1858, Maria Jesus and her two children, Felix and his half-sister, Teodora Rangel, went to live with John Ward, an Irishman who had moved to the Arizona Territory and started a ranch. According to the United States Census, dated August 26, 1860, Felix Ward, as he was then known, was 12 years old. Despite later claims by a half-brother, Santiago Ward, that he was born on July 25, 1860, this contradicts the information recorded in the census. Before his death in 1867, John Ward and Maria Jesus had five children together. As Felix matured, he became a slender teenager with reddish-brown hair, light skin, and a blind left eye due to an infection in infancy. During this time, the Sonoyita Valley contained seven farms, one of which was owned and operated by John Ward, covering 160 acres, surrounded by oak, willow, and cottonwood trees. Felix assisted his stepfather with the ranch work. On January 27, 1861, a group of Apache raiders, likely returning from a raid in Sonora, attacked the Ward farm. John Ward was not present at the time, as he was conducting business near Sonoyita Creek. John Cole, a coachmaker, was ill and likely resting in the blacksmith shop. He witnessed nine Apache warriors storming into the house with the intention of kidnapping the women and children. Simultaneously, another group of raiders targeted the livestock on the opposite side of the creek. To their surprise, the Apaches spotted 12-year-old Felix perched in a peach tree. They demanded he come down, and he complied. At that moment, two American individuals arrived and frightened the Apaches away. They fled with 20 cattle and the young Felix, while his mother and siblings were unharmed. Upon returning home, John Ward discovered from neighbors that his cattle and stepson had been taken by Apaches. He promptly sought help from Lieutenant Colonel Pitcairn Morrison at Fort Buchanan, believing that his stepson had been abducted by Chiricahua Apaches insisting on military action. On the morning of January 29th, 2nd Lieutenant George Bascom of the 7th Infantry, accompanied by John Ward, departed from Fort Buchanan with 54 soldiers to retrieve the Ward boy. Mr. Ward was convinced that Cochise and his Chiricahua Apaches were responsible for his stepson's abduction, a belief shared by Lieutenant Bascom. Bascom in charge of Company C, 7th Infantry, understood from past experiences that only Chiricahua Apaches traveled eastward. However, he was unaware that the establishment of Fort Breckenridge on Aravaipa Creek and the San Pedro River in the Pinal homeland had redirected all Apache raiders eastward, and not just the Chiricahua. What followed was a grave mistake that led to 25 years of intense warfare between the United States and the Chiricahua Apaches. The Bascom expedition tracked the trail to Apache Pass and, on February 3rd, sent a message for Cochise, the leader of the Chicon and Chiricahua Apaches, to meet with them. At that time, Cochise and his Apaches were living in peace with the white settlers. Cochise, unsuspecting of trouble, arrived with his brother, two nephews, wife, and their two children. He claimed he did not have the abducted child, but offered to identify the responsible party within 10 days. Bascom accused Cochise of kidnapping the ward boy regardless. Cochise denied the accusation, but Bascom persisted, leading to a heated exchange of words. Bascom then surrounded the Apaches, informing Cochise that they would be held as hostages until the child was returned. Cochise managed to escape and captured hostages of his own to negotiate in exchange, but Bascom refused. This refusal escalated tensions, 
resulting in both sides exchanging gunfire and initiating a cycle of violent retaliations before the Chiricahua Apaches declared war. It's likely that the Aravaipa Apaches, a group of Western Apache, were the ones who initially captured young Felix. He was then traded among various Western Apache groups until he ended up with the White Mountain Apaches, who lived about 25 miles southwest of modern-day McNary, Arizona. There, Felix spent the next decade of his life and eventually became an Apache warrior. He was raised by an Apache clan leader named Nyandia and became the stepbrother of John Rope. On December 2, 1872, Lieutenant John Burke, who was working closely with General Crook, enlisted 47 Western Apaches at Camp Apache to serve as scouts against hostile Apaches. Among them was a young warrior in his early 20s, standing around 5 foot 7 inches, slim, with auburn hair, fair skin, and one blue eye, blind in the other. According to author Paul Andrew Hutton, the other warriors called this young man Felix. The white soldiers noticed his distinctive features, his red hair and light skin, and some remarked that he resembled a character from Charles Lever's book, Charles O'Malley, the Irish Dragoon, named Mickey Free. Hence, Felix Ward adopted the name Mickey Free. After less than a year of service as an Apache scout with the US Army, Mickey Free was promoted to corporal on April 2, 1873. Shortly after, Corporal Free witnessed the surrender of notorious Tonto Apache leaders, Cha Lipen and Dil Shea. He was later promoted to sergeant, earning $17 a month. On December 4, 1874, he was appointed as an interpreter at Camp Verde, receiving a significant pay raise to $125 a month. During his time at Camp Verde, Mickey Free met Al Sieber, who served as Chief of Scouts for much of the Apache Wars. Sieber had a strong influence on Mickey's life. Tall and tough with a large mustache, Sieber was a skilled campaigner who could track renegade Apaches until they were subdued. Sieber once described Mickey Free as half Irish, half Mexican, and a complete tough guy. Continuing his service with the United States Army, Mickey Free worked as a scout under General George Crook to track down hostile Apaches. He found himself in several intense battles while helping to capture renegade Apaches. During this time, he crossed paths with the legendary figure Tom Horn, known for his roles as an Army scout, Apache interpreter, gunman, and Pinkerton detective. Tom Horn described Mickey as someone who had mastered both Mexican and Apache languages and was fearless to the extreme. Mickey's distinctive appearance, with long fiery red hair and one blue eye, made him stand out. Despite his courage, he seemed to care little for his own safety. In 1883, Free joined General Crook's expedition to the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico, where they pursued hostile Chiricahua Apaches led by Geronimo, Naiche, Chihuahua, Chato, Bonito, Nana, and Loco. During this expedition, General Crook found himself in a perilous situation when the hostile Apaches observed their presence in the mountains. Unsure of what to do, some Apaches approached Crook's camp for a discussion. Crook, realizing the need for direct communication, took a risk by casually strolling through the grass as if hunting birds, hoping to attract the Apache leaders for a conversation. Mickey Free and other scouts nervously observed the situation. Some hostile leaders approached Crook, claiming he had fired shots towards them. Before any harm could be done, Mickey Free and Severiano, another Apache scout, intervened. They engaged in dialogue with the Apaches, allowing Crook to safely return to his camp. Most of the Apaches were eventually escorted back to the United States. Back at the Apache Reservation in Turkey Creek, 
Mickey Free served as one of the informants for the white settlers. However, many Chiricahua tribesmen were wary of trusting him. In 1885, Mickey Free embarked on another mission southward into Mexico to apprehend Geronimo, Naiche, and other hostile Apaches who had fled from the reservation. Geronimo blamed Mickey Free, Chata, and Lieutenant Britton Davis for the breakout, conveniently overlooking the unlawful Tiswin gathering that defied Davis's authority and Geronimo's own scheme to harm Davis. On June 11, 1885, Captain Emmett Crawford, Lieutenant Britton Davis, and their troops, along with Apache scouts like Mickey Free, crossed the Mexican border to pursue Geronimo and Naiche. Eventually, Crawford and Davis split up their forces to search for the fugitives. Davis and his men, including Mickey Free, temporarily lost contact, but regrouped in El Paso in September 1885. Soon after, Mickey returned home to the White Mountains. In 1886, Mickey Free joined a delegation of Apaches, including Chato, to travel to Washington, D.C. Their aim was to discuss with the U.S. government what actions should be taken with the Chiricahuas once Geronimo and Naiche were captured. Just before their departure, tragedy struck as Mickey's son and another boy were shot and killed by drunken White Mountain Apache men during a drinking party. Mickey was devastated, and some believed that his journey to Washington was actually an attempt to cope with the grief. While in Washington, Mickey reunited with Captain John Bork, the man who had originally recruited him as a scout. Bork observed Mickey's disheveled appearance and noted the signs of his profound sorrow over the recent loss of his young son. During Mickey's stay in Washington, news arrived that Geronimo and Naiche had agreed to return to the United States in September 1886. At least his return to the frontier wouldn't be a complete and total dismal affair. Upon his return to Arizona, Mickey Free took on the role of a bounty hunter, pursuing renegade Apaches like the infamous Apache Kid. The Apache Kid, once an army scout, had taken revenge on another Apache for killing his father, leading to his arrest and conviction for mutiny and desertion. While being transported to Yuma Territorial Prison, he and four other Apache prisoners escaped from their guards, and the Apache Kid remained at large. As a bounty hunter, Mickey Free would have likely traversed the rugged landscapes of Arizona, utilizing his intimate knowledge of the terrain and the behaviors of the Apache people to track down fugitives. Drawing from his experiences as an Apache scout and his familiarity with the customs and hideouts of renegade Apaches, Mickey would have employed stealth, patience, and cunning in his pursuit of targets. He would have faced the constant danger of ambushes and attacks while traversing remote regions where lawlessness often prevailed. Despite these challenges, Mickey's reputation as a skilled tracker and his determination to bring fugitives to justice would have cemented his status as a formidable figure in the pursuit of law and order in the Old West. That is, until lawlessness gave way to the development of the frontier. Mickey ultimately struggled to adjust to a quieter life, often turning to alcohol. His behavior led to disciplinary actions, including a temporary demotion from his sergeant rank. Lieutenant Carter Johnson, Mickey's commanding officer at the time, described him as troublesome, noting an incident where Mickey had attacked a sergeant while intoxicated. After retiring from the U.S. Army, on July 16, 1893, he experienced both joy and sorrow in his personal life, welcoming another son in the spring of 1894, but enduring the loss of his other son and the mother of the child by 1900. Throughout his life, Mickey married four Western Apache women and had three sons and two daughters. Reverend Paul Mayerhoff, who arrived at Fort Apache in 1896, depicted Mickey as a responsible family man who valued education for his children, unlike many other Apache parents. Despite his upbringing among the Apache people, Mickey gradually adapted to the customs of the white settlers as he grew older. 
He settled in at Fort Apache Indian Reservation with the White Mountain Apaches until his death in 1914. Henceforth, Mickey Free's legacy endures as that of an Apache Indian scout and bounty hunter who left his mark on the American frontier. His kidnapping triggered a butterfly effect that would forever mold the history of the West, and his work as a man of law and war won't soon be forgotten.